thank you all for coming out this morning, town hall meeting, the uh, program committee, and our staff does such a great job of putting on these events for you. We've got very, very good speakers for you today. Um, we are having a discussion on the Eagle Ford shell and how it generates billions of dollars of economic development to support local jobs in our area. And then we'll be hearing about the 1604-281 uh, infrastructure and giving you an update on that. Here today is Gilbert Gonzalez. He has served as the Deputy Undersecretary and Acting Undersecretary of the United States Department of Agricultural Rural Development Mission Area in Washington, D.C. He also managed the Rural Housing Service and Rural Utility Service and Rural Business Corporate Cooperative Service managing effort related to minority, minority home <coughs> ownership, broadband, renewable energy, small business, and faith-based programs. He is, uh, he has joined, also been part of the Department of Homeland Security, Office of Federal Coordination for the Gulf Coast Rebuilding Team. He was instrumental in um, working with the Secretary of Agriculture during the Katrina and Rita Hurricane recovery efforts. On September 1st, 2009, Mr. Gonzalez joined the University of Texas at San Antonio Institute for Economic Development to serve as the director of the Rural, Develop Rural Business Program. He will manage the Rural Business Program with major emphasis on rural community capacity building and business development casework within the Southwest Texas borders. I will step into the presentation and I promised, I, I promised Lisa that I'll keep this to, I won't go through every single slide, I'll keep it for uh, not the duration of, of the, the PowerPoint presentation. I'll go over some slides very quickly, I, I promise. We'll give about 10 minutes for, um, for a Q&A. And I will, I will say this, I think Lisa might have been referring to me because my phone during the presentation did go <laughs> off. So I did turn it off. I forgot two, I turned one off and I put one on vibrate. So uh, we should be in good shape. So to kind of give you a perspective on Eagle Ford Shell, um, to give you a perspective in terms of as I go into this PowerPoint, because you are very visual people in terms of when you look at curb appeal, you look at real estate, you're trying to obviously buy or represent or sell somebody's property. Uh, the Eagle Ford Shell, if you could look at it from the standpoint of uh, an energy triangle and ge the geography of it from San Antonio down to Laredo, to Laredo to Corpus and back up to, to San Antonio. So you know, just visualize that. And the other visual I will give you since you um, are into land and real estate and, and improvements, the, the acreage that was under uh, lease by the industry in 2009 was about 400,000 acres. The acreage as of 2011 was 11 to 12 million acres. That's how many acres have been leased by the industry in, in a period of time, probably within a couple of years or less. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically try to go through a lot of these slides really quickly, but I'm the director of the Rural Business Program, and Lisa, I'm sorry I tortured you by giving you that bio, or, or we will shorten that next time. But I can tell you that uh, at the Institute for Economic Development, there are 12 different <laughs> program areas. I will not torture you by describing each one, but I will tell you that UTSA Institute for Economic Development is like a educationally based consulting firm. We either service business clients or we service community clients. My service area happens to be 79 counties. It just happens that Eagle Ford Shell is in our service area, keeping us extremely busy, not only on the business development side, but also on the community development side. So in terms of the baseline study, we did release this study May of 2009. If you don't have the full copy or haven't downloaded a copy, if you go to iedtexas.org, you can download the PDF version of this. I'm only gonna get really just a snapshot is what I'll share with you today of the impact of Eagle Ford Show. If you look at the primary counties, there's 14 primary counties, and I'll describe those in more detail. Those are actually where actual production, extraction activities are occurring. If you look at the adjacent counties, these are what we call beneficiary counties, periphery counties, that aren't in the extraction area or production area, but they're benefiting. Obviously, Bear County is not in the production area, but it's benefiting from it economically. 
I'll give this PowerPoint to Lisa or to Karen, and you guys are welcome to have a copy of it. Uh, Jim, the adjacent counties are Bear, Jim Wells, Nuestra, San Patricio, Uvalde, and Victoria. The the green area, at least uh, in this uh, PowerPoint, are the 14 counties. Those are the extraction and production counties. Those are where you're seeing that drilling activity. Um, I was just looking at the, and I was sharing with Lisa uh, and uh, Ms. Shields, the CEO for Sabor, that, that really the, the most active area, there's three active areas. It's really Demet County, uh, Carnes, and LaSalle County. So if you look at 1,600 completed wells, which you will see a, sh a chart in a minute, uh, Demet has about 301 active wells. And then you step into Carnes, which is about 270. Um, and then you step into LaSalle, which is about uh, 250, 260. The, the yellow area, those, remember those six counties that are kind of on the periphery, beneficiary counties? Uh, the, the other areas, uh, initially the Railroad Commission said there was 24 Eagle Ford Shell counties, and the way they determined that, the Railroad Commission obviously is the regulator over this industry, and determined that there was 24 counties. Well, they, they we, for the, for the sake of the study, said, where is the most impact occurring right now, and where will it occur after about a year or two of just kind of analyzing some of the uh, Railroad Commission data. The first part of the study was released May 9th. Uh, there's going to be three parts to this study. Uh, the first one is really the economic impact, which I'll share with you today in terms of jobs and what, how long will the, the actual activity occur. Uh, that's the big question all, everyone is asking. How long will this take? Is it a boom? It's going to bust eventually. So when is that going to occur? So I'll address that uh, in a bit here. Part two, late summer, early fall is really the workforce analysis. You know, what kind of jobs are going to be created, permanent jobs are going to be created from Eagle Ford Shell. Uh, the last part of this is really county level data that uh, the counties can take back with them and use that research to hopefully plan, uh, do some community <coughs> planning and development in their small town. I'm going to skip this slide simply because I think this it's more uh, depictive in, in when you look at the, the actual slides or the graphs here. You can see in 2008, um, very little activity. Kind of give you the history on Eagle Ford Shell. It was actually a first discovery by Petrohawk Energy, uh, LaSalle County. And so you, you had very little activity in terms of the gas production. And you start to see it ramp up in 2009. But what we saw, and what's not any of these slides, when we looked and analyzed the data, we really started to see it really ramp up tail end of 2010. And as you can see in 2011, it, it's, it was ramped up significantly over that same period of time, more than doubled in this case, when it came to gas production. In oil production, uh, again, yeah, first find in 2008, uh, three, three times the production in, in 2009, uh, significant increase, I guess, in 2010, but that was at the tail end of 2010. Uh, and you could see where uh, we were at 28 million or billion barrels of oil uh, in 2011. Condensate, um, it's, it's kind of like a light crude oil, uh, and they call it liquid condensate. What makes Eagle Ford Shell so unique is that they call it a triple play. And uh, the industry calls it a triple play from the standpoint that it, they're extracting or able to extract not only natural gas, but liquid condensate and oil from this. So right now, for example, because of the gas prices being so low, they've kind of halted the gas production side, but they are actually engaged in the oil production side and liquid condensate. To kind of give you a snapshot um, of some of the, um, the completions, it was what we call completions or Christmas trees that they put when they drill and they frack and they finally cap the well or they put uh, what we call a Christmas tree. Uh, you can see the activity and I think I was sharing with you um, Demet, uh, you can see the activity there over, that, over this period of time in terms of completed wells. Uh, you can look at Carnes and LaSalle uh, and just Webb is on there. But if I remember, Webb was like about 200 and something completed wells, 203, 204, but it's all gas. And if you looked at a um, if energy map beginning like Eagle Ford Shell, just so you know, just the, the, mile, the miles and the dimensions of it, it's 400 miles long. It goes from like uh, Maverick, Webb County, uh, all the way up to uh, DeWitt, which is Quero, uh, Victoria and that area. <coughs> It's a narrow swath, but it, it does go, and it's wide on the bottom from the southwestern part, and it moves northeast. 
but you can see the most active areas and again gas obviously because of the price you're not seeing a lot of activity there but if you look at an energy map south texas has a lot of natural gas as you move up you have liquid condensate as you move up to like uh, LaSalle and Demet, you have a lot of oil as well as in the uh, the Carnes area and I believe it's in the Gonzales area as well. In terms of the uh, the study what it revealed for the 14 counties, the 14 primary counties was that there was a 20 billion dollar economic impact uh, in 2011 just alone. Uh, 38,000 jobs were supported and the average salaries you know have jumped up somewhat uh, from the base of being 23400 to about 31000 and on the top end 36000 and it's generated about 2.6 billion almost 3 billion in salaries and benefits uh, paid to workers that's the 14 county area in terms of the 20 county area uh, which are included in Bear County noises uh, to the east there you've got 25 billion and about 47000 jobs that were supported in 2011 Kind of give you a snapshot of small towns and, and in terms of what they're seeing. Uh, obviously, it's an opportunity. It's a windfall they're trying to obviously capitalize on. Uh, if you know most small towns, and I asked this question yesterday, how many of you all from small towns that are sitting here? And what what town are you from? That is good. So you're feeling some of that as well. Anybody else from small town? I said we got just one one of you representing small towns, but. I, I can share with you that uh, if you haven't been there, if you live there and now live in San Antonio, uh, this is something phenomenal. You don't see this. You know, small towns are basically trying to survive. Uh, here's an opportunity to thrive and create sustainability around not only their small town, but throughout the region of Eagle Fort Shell. This is, you're seeing triple digit type of sales tax coming to these small towns. Uh, Carn City, you've got 2010, uh, which is the yellow bar, 2011 you can see the, the growth in just sales tax. What's not been researched yet, you know, from a real estate standpoint, is the ad valorem tax that will be created by the sustainable housing options that these communities elect to move towards, whether they're multifamily or single family. They're not hotels, and I'm not, and I'm not picking on hotels, but the industry is good, just so you'll know. It's a very calibrated industry. It moves in one unit. You know, when it, there is a play and it does discovery and identifies that there is extraction opportunities and it's feasible for them to drill with the new technology they have, then they will. But they bring their employees, that, which are transitional and temporary, they will bring their contractors, their subcontractors. Their calibration as, as an industry is phenomenal. If you looked at, man, it's almost like a manufacturing operation. If they miss a heartbeat, if they don't have a reliable contractor, someone supplying them. They cannot afford any downtime. They cannot. They try to minimize incident rates when it comes to any accidents, but it's in terms of safety, I've never seen anything quite like it. If you haven't been to any of these uh, yards or sites or to see or on a rig or on a fracking operation, you get firsthand to see, I, we see the research, but if you get to the field and see operationally what's being done, you can see the industry and how it moves, and you can see a sense of hope and opportunity in these small towns. And I'll just, I'm thinking about Quero, Texas. When I went to Quero last year, and I was taking a tour of a Pioneer Energy site and a fracking operation, we were there from that morning till seven o'clock that night. And what I saw, I was with the mayor from Quero, and what I saw, she had kind of not really received the industry in a real positive way. <coughs> But during the course of the day, what I saw was a transition that occurred right before my very eyes where she said, now I understand what you do. I understand the impact you're having in terms of jobs. I understand the need that you have uh, for workers. And she, at the very end, her comments in closing were, uh, thank you very much for what you're doing. But it's almost a renewed sense of hope and opportunity small towns they had not seen in many years. Carrizo Springs is, um, you know, is, uh, is another phenomenal situation that it's occurring. Uh, last year they probably had about 500,000 in sales tax, 2010. 2011 they had 5 million in sales tax. Never seen before. Uh, it's so essential for them to have a plan, a plan for the future, what that community is going to look like, and it's an opportunity for them to really begin <coughs> to look at diversifying their economic base. Historically, a lot of these small towns, and still are, agriculture based. 
that not made the transition. But with this oil and gas opportunity, the community leaders are trying to say, how do we diversify now that it's booming? You could see 2008, there was 13 completed wells. I mean, there was, again, that was the, the initial discovery. You can see 2009, you had a, about 129 completed wells. Uh, you, you had significant growth again in 2010, tailed end of 2010, and it more than tripled in 2011. And you've got it in terms of completions, you've got about 3,800 is the actual permitting that occurred last year. Of those 3,800, you've got 1,649 completions. I won't uh, bore you too much. We, we kind of used our forecasting tools and we changed our forecasting method from the initial study we did back in 2011. And the, the one in the red, um, I believe, is the BAS model. But what we, at the end of the day, you know, as economists or even as forecasters, you know, you're always looking at three different scenarios, low, mid, middle, and high. And we tend to always go towards the, the moderate assumption. And in most cases, that's somewhere in the middle. These are the operators, uh, the top 10 operators that are uh, operating in, in Eagle Ford Shell. Anadarko with, uh, again, completed wells of about 184. Uh, you've got Geo Southern with about 82, Petrohawk, and so forth. In terms of oil uh, completions, you had EOG, um, Resources, Chesapeake, um, Burlington, and, and the others as, as follows. This just kind of graphically shows what I just shared with you in terms of the actual completed wells and, and also which companies are located in which areas. The economic impact of Bear County, 2011, about 700 million um, of, the, remember the 25 billion we were talking about? So Bear County and that triangle obviously generated of the 20 counties generated about 700 million, 42 or 4,300 jobs uh, in Bear County. And I know as realtors in Bear County, you guys are going, how many more workers, how many more companies are moving to the area? What are they looking for? And I'm going to share with you some ideas that I think as a result of uh, the last three meetings, what I think are just, I've shared some of them with Lisa, but maybe some next steps for you as realtors of how to begin to approach uh, the opportunities within the industry. Obviously, uh, one of the things, natural gas, I've mentioned that. It's, there's obviously a, a glut of it There's in terms of an inventory. They're trying and scrambling the industry. So what are other applications of natural gas? So they're studying it. They're looking at, they can actually liquefy it. They can compress it. They can ship it internationally. At the price that it's at, they could ship it to China. Uh, not too long ago, there was a discussion. I was in Victoria, Texas, and there was a Chinese, de uh, Japanese delegation. And if you remember what happened last March in China or ja in Japan, there was actually the tsunami and obviously the nuclear plants that were all shut down. So they're looking for alternative uses of energy. Natural gas seems to be appealing to them. So it's possible that the United States could actually ship that natural gas to Japan as they begin to build the infrastructure for the utility system in Japan. The other thing uh, that you've heard recently, probably CPS Energy is a good example, where they're looking at their coal burning plants uh, and they're looking at converting those into, if not converting, buying what we call natural gas burning plants to generate electricity. Obviously because of the price uh, of natural gas, but also because natural gas is a cleaner source to burn than coal from an environment standpoint. The other uses of the manufacturers. Uh, many manufacturers obviously would use natural gas right now, probably be more efficient for them uh, and obviously more cost effective. And then you're hearing a lot of discussion right now about conversions of local fleets to compress natural gas. Um, the biggest challenge there is where do you go fill up? Where are you or industry or commercial businesses going to go fill up their fleet? There's only, you can see in San Antonio, there are probably no filling stations when it comes to natural gas outside of maybe uh, a couple of industrial sites. But you know, Laredo has one, Corpus has one. Uh, Austin has a couple, Fort Worth and, and Houston and so forth. So to ramp that process up, and have that kind of distribution network for natural gas is going to take some time. But there's discussions right now of, of doing so and kind of really getting behind that. So here's where we're at in terms of the actual gas production. Uh, it, this gas and oil production are about at the same point. Somebody would ask, well, where are we at in the play? And 
the study is based on the next 10 years, so to 2021. But you can see experts will say that we're only 6% into the oil and gas play. That leaves 94% yet mm -hmm. to produce. Uh, and you'll see, we did an estimate of how many wells would be actually drilled each year. And all these scenarios here are basically, at least the one we're gonna end up landing on is about 25,000 wells for the entire period of time. That means 2,500 wells per year for the next 10 years. These are obviously factors that are, uh, affect price with oil. And right now, just I remember about a month or so ago, uh, price per barrel was somewhere around 100 bucks a barrel. It's around 80, right below 80 right now. And so the question becomes, and this is the caveat I share with you, as a lot of people that do forecasting or projections, you got to keep in mind this: the production is going to be based on that them staying above the break-even point, right? At some point, if price of oil drops, they're going to say we're going to slow it down a little bit. And that's always probably kind of one of those things. It's kind of like I come from a background of banking and finance, and I can tell you that when we forecast it out for three years or five years, it's based, if, the, if interest rate went up, lending probably dropped. If it was down, you're gonna see production, you know, production higher on the, on the lending side. So the variable here is the price per barrel. And all these contributors affect oil prices, whether it's global <coughs> supply, whether it's OPEC, you know, whether it's the Middle East crisis that's occurring. There's a lot of stress factors in this industry, and I think all we're doing here is just highlighting that. <coughs> These were the models that we used. I think what I shared with you earlier, we end up with really the, ba uh, the Bass model, which is the blue line. It, it seems to be more indicative of where this is going to go. But if you can see the, the last year on this graph uh, shows approximately you know, 2023, 2021. You're going to see it taper off. There'll still be production that will be occurring over the next 10, 15 years after that. You're just seeing a 10 year snapshot, but after that, you'll see another 10, year, 10 to 15 years of actual production. Because you gotta remember 2021, they're still drilling and they're actually still uh, completing new wells. One of the things that, uh, I guess we, we just added this slide, but uh, banks in, in the entire area are very liquid. I won't leave out credit unions either. We had a credit union representative yesterday. But, but typically the local banks are flush with cash. And to me, the, a lot of this is like uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, and, and I'll share this with you because it, as a kid growing up and Texas Tea, and, and this is Texas Tea, and you had landowners that basically their kids are off the ranch and off the land saying, see you mom, see you grandma, see you granddad or whatever. And they're thinking, we're never gonna be able to sell this for what we wanna get out of it. It's, it's clear and free. But all of a sudden, Eagle Ford Shell, right? And they're experiencing something. Kids are coming back to the farm, probably, and back to the ranch. But, but, and, but not them alone. You've got uh, investment banking firms that are gonna tag along with me when I go down there, when we have meetings that say, well, you introduced me to some of the landowners. You know, it's just interesting. I mean, realtors probably fall in that group as well, but people that really don't really know anybody there are kind of saying, you're gonna have a meeting down. We were out there quite a bit. So all of a sudden, I've got, good friends, whether it's Merrill Lynch, and I can pick on Merrill Lynch, but, and others, they're saying there's being new wealth created, and so uh, what options do they have? And I, you know, I said, well, why don't you go find out? But, but the opportunity is huge. And I'll just share with you this one bank story. Lady grandma walks into bank, gives a deposit to the teller. She writes that deposit, a check for 100,000. The teller says it's the wrong amount. In fact, you left a few numbers off. It's one million one hundred thousand. So you hear stories like that all the time, and ladies that keep their checks in their purse because they don't want anybody to know they've got this new wealth, right? Because everybody's going to talk after all in a small town. If you know small towns, next thing you know, word gets around that so and so has new wealth, and and people are very private in small towns. I just they, there's the term and I know small towns, but I can just say that there's a term that they're an outsider, right? And so you're not from that small town and unless you've related to somebody that's from that town. But it's kind of an interesting dynamic. That's something you cannot capture in a study, but you can talk about it when you see it. So these are the, remember I said low, moderate, high uh, estimates that we did for economic impact, uh, 26 billion low, 96 billion high in terms of employment from 44 to 115. 
14 county, we're looking at 62 billion economic impact, 83,000 jobs uh, over that 10-year period of time. Where we went with was in the study, we said it's a moderate scenario, economic impact is about 90 billion. Uh, we're saying 100, and round, that, round that up to 120,000 jobs. And that's uh, basically 12,000 jobs uh, over the next 10 years. I, I won't go through all this, but this is just a summary of critical needs that we see in small towns. We work with small towns. Uh, we work on what we call sustainability strategies for them. And uh, a lot of, see, this is a huge opportunity from the beginning to look at sustainability, to create jobs, diversify their economic base. These are a host of things they need, uh, that they need to do. Medium to long-term planning is essential. Um, they just don't have the capacity to know what to do when they see the advert larum tax is going to be coming their way and when they have the actual sales tax that they have. Uh, Carrizo Springs just uh, issued a bond for $34 million recently last year and they're expanding their school district. So where these towns invest, that's the question. In order to do housing, they need infrastructure. In order to have infrastructure, they need planning and they need planning and they need some zoning. So some of those communities do not have those capabilities. So we're, we're trying to work with them with some of our other colleges, like the College of Architecture and Public Policy. <coughs> Again, uh, I won't go through all this. This is just uh, Gardendale, Texas, which was really a boarded up community. It used to be an ag center back in the 50s, 60s, somewhere in that time. It was a place where all the farmers and ranchers came and brought their crops. And it was boarded up for years. And what I don't have here is a picture. This picture is worth a thousand words, but I can tell you when you, the aerials that you had, you had it was a nice aerial shot, but they also had shots of the, the rail, the infrastructure was completely in disrepair. And so this is a rail yard for the industry down there. And whether it's sand or uh, primarily in other products and, and material products that they need to ship. This is uh, some of the hotels that you see. And it's very typical for a, it's very typical for an operator, oil and gas operator, to approach a developer of a hotel and say, look, if you build a hotel for my workers, I'll, I'll, we'll go ahead and issue a two or three year contract. Depending on what you look at crew camps, what we call crew camps, and I'll share you with you, some people call them man camps, but we're trying to move away from the man camp thing and, and be a little sensitive to that, and you're hearing people say crew camps and, and corporate housing. This is kind of a, a crew camp, it's very modular. Uh, they're moving towards that. It doesn't have a lot of curb appeal like you guys like to see, um, but it, 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 it works for the industry. Uh, here's a better uh, model for probably model housing that they use or crew camp housing that they use uh, in that area as well. Um, the situation there is one of the biggest needs for the locals is affordable housing. There's not there's a shortage of affordable multifamily or single family housing. You've got the local that's been displaced. That's the dynamic because the industry has taken every possible house that's available that, that can be used, whether it's four or five workers living in a house. But they're trying to relieve some of that, but the existing housing stock obviously isn't going to meet the needs of the industry and or the locals. Uh, this is another crew camp that, that you have a picture of. This is Gardendale's here. Asking Gardendale is right by Cotula, Texas, to the western part of 35. And this is another aerial, but when you get a greater sense of appreciation if you go down there. Uh, obviously, if you're in a helicopter, you probably get a greater sense of appreciation in terms of how much it's grown. Uh, again, that's, that's my presentation. I